<laughs> what do I do with them? <laughs> yeah. Are they mine or not? <laughs> not mine. They're yeah. Wifey, they're yours. Yeah. And the wife is saying, who? Who are you? I've never known you. <laughs> yeah, there's good days and bad days. That's for sure. And we are live on Facebook. Awesome. And so let's begin. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, being a part of Raw Life. Let me introduce you to the rest of the world, who you are. So our speaker today is the founder of Powerful Humans uh, the, he, to support leaders in developing highly agile, empowered and anti-fragile teams so they can work more effectively in complex environments where the consequences of failure are high. Our speaker is a world-class human-powered explorer and team decision-making coach. From the street level to the boardroom, international seven-side rugby player to over 50 expedition expeditions across the globe, including walking across countries, cycling across continents, climbing Mount Everest, and crossing seas completely by human power. He dedicates his life to the pursuit of bold, unique goals. He's a native of New Zealand. He lives in Singapore, holds a bachelor in post, uh, and a postgraduate degree, is an associate certified coach with uh, International Coaching Federation, ICF, as we all know it, a professional member of Asian Professional Speaker Association, and co-chair of the Royal Geographic Society, the Singapore branch. May I welcome to you Grant X. Rawlinson, and he is happily married to the beautiful Stephanie, whom he shares the joy of raising twin explorers, Kate and Rachel. Thank you, Grant, for being on the show. Truly appreciate it. Hey, good, uh, good afternoon. Is it for you, Rohit? It's good afternoon here in Singapore. So it's good morning still for us. It's good morning still. Sorry, I apologize. <laughs> yeah. so good, good morning to you. It's uh, really nice to be here. Thank you, thank you. So your topic is anti-fragile, being anti-fragile. Before we get into this whole talk about being anti-fragile, just a brief about your journey, what got to, where were you and how you got to where you are at the moment? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, you just gave a very nice introduction. Thank you very much. So originally okay. from New Zealand, yeah. Born and bred in New Zealand, but I left uh, New Zealand at a very early age, uh, well, in my career, um, basically, I never worked in New Zealand. I completed my university education. I moved straight to Singapore. I was very lucky to have an opportunity here in Singapore. Um, so uh, basically, uh, the majority of my working life, I've been based in Singapore for uh, almost 20 or just over 20 years. So many years I've actually forgotten. Um, I've stopped counting. Uh, but it's, uh, it's in the 20s, 20 years now or so. So, mm. uh, you know, my major passion in life has really been making these long exploratory human powered journeys around the planet. Hmm. And um, I don't know if uh, any of the listeners out there have ever uh, made long um, exploratory human powered journeys around the planet. If you haven't, let me just share with you that it doesn't pay very well. <laughs> <laughs> make it very clear to the <laughs> And it's that. exhausting. <laughs> That's right. Let's get that out there straight away. Uh, you know, so my expeditions over the years have gone from that journey. Uh, okay. But fast forward 20 years as my level of ambition um, grew, uh, you know, the, the cost of the expedition started getting up to around half a million dollars wow. um, and taking years, not 18 days, but three years of preparation, one or two years for the actual journeys themselves. Well, um, so, you know, as as um, as time has gone by, as I said, these these journeys don't pay very well. It's kind of an understatement. Even mm. though I, I um, get significant amounts of sponsorship to help fund the journeys, um, still there's this massive question, Rohit. I mean, how do you fund a lifestyle like this? How do you make it sustainable? Yes. People might say, well, just become a professional adventurer, a professional explorer, or become a guide or something like that. And that was never, the, I've looked at that kind of lifestyle and I, I saw the kind of money that you make and the effort and hard work you have to put into it. And it's, um, I thought there must be a different way to, hmm. to lead my life in the way um, that I want to lead it, have the time off to go on these expeditions, but still have a family, um, have children, have a, have a, um, you know, a loving wife, have a home, have a, have a nice home base, etc. 
And that's um, when I uh, thought, you know, the only the only way I can really do this is set is start my own business, hmm. run my own business, and make it a success, make it a successful hmm. business. And so, um, three years ago, I set up Powerful Humans, um, hmm. which is named the name Powerful Humans comes after my passion for human powered exploration. Hmm. And Powerful Humans basically um, is a is a leadership and team con consultancy where I um, translate my journeys that I've made around the globe into learning journeys. And I take corporate teams specifically through these, uh, through these um, journeys, but uh, they don't actually get out there in the boat or on the mountain, <laughs> actually, but they, they, they do this from the comfort of the boardroom or now virtually from home. Yeah. And my business has allowed me, it's gone very well in the last three years and it's allowed me to um, begin to create this lifestyle where I can um, go on my expeditions when I want to, and I can be home being my own boss, running my own company and um, making, you know, the kind of money that, that you need to live in a place like Singapore and, um, and comfortably sustain mm. a, um, a family in comfort. Mm. So that's a, a, a summary of how I got to where I am. Okay. So why grant acts? Right. So great question. So, um, you know, what my, my first love, when I, I grew up in a very small environment on a sheep farm in New Zealand. Okay. Uh, I, I went to school with nine other children. Uh, that wow. wasn't in my class. That was in my whole school. Three of them were my brothers and sisters. So um, it's, um, as you can um, imagine, it's, it was quite a small environment, but a, a wonderful environment. So, you know, we had this whole farm that um, every, every single day after school was like your playground. And uh, I always loved adventuring from an early age, but something got in the way once I found the national religion of New Zealand, which happens to be a sport called rugby. And um, I'm a very, very naturally just a competitive person and I loved playing rugby. I just loved it everywhere I went through as I, as I got to a big enough school, which actually had a rugby team when I was about 12 or 13, yeah. uh, I started playing rugby and um, I just thought rugby was just the most beautiful thing in the entire world. All my mm. friends are from rugby. I always played rugby to my highest level at high school to universities. When I came to Singapore here in, um, um, in 19, in the 2000 somewhere, I, um, I started playing for the Singapore national team. And I was playing in the, these international tournaments with the national team of Singapore all around the region, you know, the Hong Kong sevens, the biggest mm. international tournament in the world. When unfortunately, after uh, 25 years of doing the thing I absolutely loved, um, I, um, I got hit in a big tackle and, uh, my, my mm. ankle dislocated and my leg broke and, um, I was, um, carried off the field on a stretcher to hospital and it effectively in ended my, my rugby career. Mm. But, you know, as I was playing rugby, going through my rugby career, um, I'm, I'm a lot smaller than most, uh, most rugby players. Yes. And, uh, so I used to tackle people by diving in very low and hard at their, at their legs and, um, and that the name X came from a um, uh, kind of a comparison to the way I used to tackle um, diving uh -huh. very low and hard and chopping people off at the knees. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so moving on from there, you started the, is that after that you started the consultancy? Um, so that was a long time ago. No, I didn't really start. I mean, my, my journey into my um, uh, team kind of consultancy, my business now, it was a it was kind of a very gradual journey when i was um you know as my expeditions rose in their kind of ambition and the 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 budgets uh increased as well mm. i i found it more and more difficult to fund them all by myself so i needed to mm. start going and looking for sponsorship mm. and looking for sponsorship is very very difficult mm. and um one of the difficult things is trying to find something significant to, of value to give back to the sponsors mm. and uh, I, I just stumbled this into, into this by accident is that um, some of the sponsors said, could you give a talk to our clients? Oh. And, you, know, you can put the, you can take the little, all the, all this, all the simple stuff, which isn't really of much value take your logo and get some photos with it. Yeah. Um, but they said, but can you do a talk to some of our clients? I was like, oh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I guess so. So I very nervously did a talk, a couple of talks to some clients and then, um, people came up to me at the end of that. And I still remember it was a bank in Singapore, someone from a bank and said, um, oh, would you come and talk to our staff? We really, really enjoyed that talk. Would you come and talk to our staff? And I was like, well, I guess so. And they said, 
how much do you charge? And I, and I almost fell over. I was like, how much do I charge? I, I never thought about that. I didn't know you were going to pay me. Hey, I get paid for speaking. What's this all about? Who pays money for someone to stand up and tell a story? Um, but but it, that made me realize, uh, and that slowly kind of, you know, introduced me to this whole world of professional speaking. And over the years, I had a full-time job at that time still. And for about six years, hmm. I ran like a, uh, um, a part-time speaking business where yeah. I would have to try and slot it into my full-time job. So it was maybe after dinner talks and I'd maybe I'd do one yep. paid talk a month or something. But it was a great introduction, at least to, you know, commercializing um um, speaking and understanding mm. how the business runs and that client relation, well, the whole world of professional speaking, which you know very well, Rohit, which is very hard to read a book and understand. You've got to get out there and start to understand it. So yeah. um, it was, I did that for a few years and I was taught umming and ahhing whether it's like, oh, should I quit my corporate job and go into this mm. full time? And three years ago, I made that big decision to, to leave the corporate world and go full time into my business. And um, that was a very, very scary decision, to be honest at the time. Mm. Um, it was much scarier than actually working in the business. The actual making mm. the decision was the scary thing. Once I made that decision, it was like, poof, the world, mm. everything became easy. <laughs> wow. So I, I met you the first time in uh, 2018. I think it was in March. And this was at the Speakers Academy. And later on, I saw you speak at one of the at one of the meetings for the association, the Speakers Association. And I saw you talk about team decision making. Uh, you had the videos and everything. And I was extremely intrigued because I've been to a number of team uh, building or development sessions. But what I saw with yours was a very practical aspect and a very different way to look at it and a very intense where failure can happen at any moment and you don't know when it's going to happen. I saw you and I, I was like, wow, this is tro truly, truly amazing. So I know you're known for mindset. I know you're known for team decision making. And over the COVID period, I've heard you talk about anti-fragile. Yeah. So what is this anti-fragile all about? Yeah, so... So basically, um, everyone now during the coronavirus is um, talking about resilience, talking about mental strength yep. for, for very obvious reasons. You know, uh, there's, and, and you and I both experience this running our own businesses in a, in a space which traditionally has been face-to-face -face where, yes. where you meet face-to-face -face with large amounts of people. Our, our businesses have been enormously disrupted. Suddenly you go from, uh, you know, an income stream which is going along you know very nicely and within when coronavirus hit it went like that um you know not down to a, a little bit per month but you know in the month of march you know mine went down close to zero um hmm. and you know when you when you've got um, responsibilities and family etc like and um that rely on you that's it's very stressful yes uh, especially when you have your own business i know in the corporate world it's stressful i worked in the corporate world for 17 years it's different when you have your own business. Yes. You don't have that safety net every month of, um, of you know, there's a salary going to come in on the last yep. Thursday of every month. And, and you know, if things might get tough. You might get laid off from the corporate world. And when you're running your own business, it's everything, you know, cash flow is everything. And um, getting customers is everything. So it can be very stressful. So, you know, this whole thing about resilience is very important at the moment. And I'd never been, a, um, a re I'd never sp spoken about resilience. Hmm. up until up until this stage but suddenly i saw everyone jumping on the bandwagon talking about resilience oh this is the model of resilience and i was like oh yeah i better listen to some of this it sounds yeah. really important and most of the stuff i listened to was crap it was terrible it was by people who had written it you know read a book or, or something like that or or never experienced there are there are some good stuff but it's yes. in the minority because you know you 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 want to you want to hear about resilience from someone who's actually uh, been through some tough times, not through someone who's read a book about it and is going to tell you um, a story about someone else. Hmm. So I was um, just um, very disillusioned with all this, and 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 I also started to get asked um, to speak about resilience as well. And I was like, you know, I've never just I've never just thought about resilience as being the the kind of thing where you just stand there and um, take the knocks. I mean, I'll give you an example. 
after my rugby playing career was over, I was trying to look for a new passion in life. And um, I thought I might try out boxing. Okay. So uh, I had a few boxing fights. I think I had um, three fights. In my third flight, I got, I got smashed in the nose very early in the first round. It was just pissing out with blood everywhere, all over my face. Um, and, um, you know, I could hardly see, you know, you got 800 people in the audience, most of them are drunk and they're screaming, you know, for the opponent to either knock you out or, or you to knock the opponent out. It's an extremely intense and lonely, um, um, place to be in the boxing ring, but, you know, I lost that fight, but I only just managed to get through each of the rounds to get to the final ding, 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 ding. Mm. And I would say that that's, that's about, that's resilience. Resilience got me through that boxing fight that was the last mm -hmm. fight i ever fought you know i i i hung up my gloves after that mm. that was resilience for me that's resilience now resilience is about you know is about that boxer in the ring who's literally getting the crap kicked out of them their nose is bleeding you know they're not winning but they're holding on and you can respect that you can respect yes. that kind of thing you know it's tough and they, they get to the end they may not have won you say wow that's resilience but you know to be honest, who really wants to be, who, who wants to be that boxer? I was that boxer. It's not a great, great place to be. It might get you through the short term. It gets you through the short term. But do you want to live your life like that? Do you want to live your life like the boxer who's like getting the crap beaten out of them and just getting through it and say, I'm resilient. And I, I was, I was, I just, I just don't think resilient was, uh, resilience is, is, is what we need to be looking at, looking for. And I know in my life, people find it very hard to understand what I do and some of my human powered expeditions where I have lots of failures and setbacks because I go yes. on exploratory journeys. When you're trying exploratory journeys, never been tried before, never been attempted before, you're, always, you're, you're taking a step into the unknown. You're literally, hmm. you're, you're learning as you go. You can't say, hey, Rohit, I, I know you've done that before. Please tell me what all, everything that I need to do and what I shouldn't do. You don't have that. So your failure rate goes up. And I had setback after failure and setback after setback. And a lot of people say, what, why are you going back out there again? You must be so resilient. You know, you must be so mentally strong. And I was like, it, I'm not, I'm not. But I was like, that's not it. There's something more than that. I, I don't know what it is, but it's not resilient. My mindset's not resilience. And I was reading, I was reading this book, Ikigai, once, which is a yes. very popular book. I'm sure you've read it as well. And and I was trying to understand. I mean, I love I love this book, and I love you know learning about the Okinawans and the way they they read their life. And that's where I first chanced across this word anti fragility. Okay. Um, it wasn't described very well in that book. Um, and I was like, hmm, you know, the Okinawans, for anyone who, who's not aware of this, sorry, let me just um, decline okay, that. Decline. Uh, why that come up? The, the Okinawans are hmm. uh, basically the world's longest living people. You know, wow. they live into the 110s, 120s. Hmm. Uh, not just one or two of them, but, you know, a whole community of them. So, uh, you know, the world's most, in my definition, the world's most powerful humans, and they have some, some things in common. Hmm. Uh, for example, um, they, they live on an island. There, there's communities around the world which have very uh, old people and, you know, or, or um, people who live to a very old age, and they have a few things in common. They generally live on small islands. They don't live hmm. in major cities in, um, you know, in the middle of, uh, of countries, but they live on smaller islands. They grow their own gardens generally. Hmm. They, mm. they have a very um, strong sense of life purpose. Mm. Something in their life which is a very strong sense of life purpose. And um, they're physically active every day, not to an extreme um, kind of scenario, but, you know, to at least like going out and doing their gardening and, and a moderate level of activity every day. And they're, they're, they're anti-fragile. I was like, what is this anti-fragile? So I started to look more into it. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a chap in the U.S., Nassim Taleb, a scholar who, um, who actually coined the phrase anti-fragile. And, and when I read it, I was like, bingo, that's exactly what resilience is to me. That's what I do, hmm. the word anti-fragile. And that's, um, it just, it just it, it fitted so nicely that um, it was, and it was a, almost like a, a massive relief. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation Rohit when someone's asked you to describe something and you know what it is yourself but yes. you can't put it into words 
Yes. And then finally, when you're able to put it into words, it almost feels like the, the weight of the world is, is lifted mm. off your, your shoulders. So mm. for me, it was finding out, um, you know, the, um, this, this definition of anti-fragile in it, because that, that's what I aligned with and related to completely. Mm. So I still haven't explained it to you. So let me explain it in a, <laughs> in a, a simpler possible way that I can. So to think about it, we need to think about this, this, this model of resilience in three parts. Firstly, something that's fragile. Okay, so we have a fragile system. You know, you may have something yourself um, in, your, um, in your office where you're sitting now. This cup, for example, could be considered fragile because if there's an external force which is applied to it, it will break hmm. relatively easy. Hmm. Now, if I asked you to, to think, Rohit, you know, what's the, what's the opposite of something which is fragile? explain um give me some adjectives which are the opposite of fragile most people would say um robust resilient strong yep. um someone said rough yeah, or tough yeah. yesterday yep. to me um and uh you know those things those descriptors which most people uh think is the opposite of of being fragile they generally refer to something which is the boxer in the ring the boxer mm. in the ring, when those external blows, when those external forces are mm. being applied to him, he, he stays standing. He gets a bit beaten up, but is resilient. He gets through the fight. So a robust thing holds its shape. It can hold yes. its shape when the external forces are applied to it. But by definition, that cannot be the opposite of being fragile. Mm. Because fragile things get weaker or they break when a force is applied to them. The opposite of being fragile must be when external forces are applied to something, it actually gets stronger. Hmm. Now, that is not resilient. Resilient hmm. things hold their shape. They don't get stronger when the external force is applied to them. So it turns out there's, there's no, in the English language anyway, there's no really real descriptor um, for a word which is the opposite of fragile. That's where this um, term anti-fragile was coined. So anti-fragile, it's, it's much more than just a mindset though. So you can see anti-fragile people, the Okinawans are very anti-fragile because as they go through their life and as disruption and, and, and change occurs in their life, they can deal with it. And it actually, mm. these, these changes, they can deal with them to a point they actually get stronger. They thrive mm. through dealing in changing circumstances. Living organisms, the human body, our bones, for example, if you break your bone, I've broken so many bones in my body, I've lost count. But when you break your bone, generally, it will repair itself stronger than it was before. That is a great example of anti-fragility. Hmm. Um, you can look at anti-fragility fragil fragility in terms of mindsets of people. You can see people who um, absolutely love change. They thrive on it. They look for the opportunities. They actually get stronger. I've got a friend here in Singapore um, who, when he just loves it when, when the world goes upside down, when things change and he laps it up, he, he lives off this, he gets stronger, he finds all the opportunities. Whereas you find some people who just fall to pieces. Hmm. You know, they're fragile when, when there's change. Ooh, they can't handle it. And you see hmm. some people who say, there's change going, but I'm going to stay strong. <laughs> they might be resilient. Then there's yeah. the anti-fragile, yippee, there's change. How can, we, um, <laughs> how, can we, um, how can we maximize the opportunities out of this? So being anti-fragile is a mindset, but it's also a strategic concept, which we can apply to business as well. Hmm. And I think it's fascinating to look at, at, at this model of resilience at the moment, Fragile, mm. resilient, and anti-fragile. Just look at it in the terms of the business sense mm. out there at the moment. Look at the organizations that when coronavirus hit back in February, March, or whatever country you're in, no matter what, what, what time it hit, look at the, those, those businesses which within one month of coronavirus hitting, they were, you know, cash flows dried up. They're going downhill very quickly or they close within one month. You know, looking at that model, they were very, very fragile, hmm. extremely fragile. As soon as something changed in the market, they, they're dead, they're gone. Hmm. Then let's look at the resilient businesses. The resilient businesses are the ones like, oh, coronavirus has hit, cash flows dried up, or it's plummeted. You know, sales have dropped by 80% or 90%. Luckily, we had a reserve. You know, we got some reserve. So our run rate 
how long can we last from a cash flow cash flow perspective we can you know we can drop the cost as much as possible mm -hmm. but uh you know we can last six months we can last eight months we can last one year we can last four months whatever mm -hmm. you know and, and at the end of that hopefully things will pick up we'll kind of be in the same shape as where we left off resilient right mm -hmm. anti-fragile organizations are wow Coronavirus has hit. All this, all these changes have occurred. Wow! How can we benefit of? How can we benefit from them? You know, mm. how can we actually get stronger through through this uh, through this whole disruption? You know, mm. I'll give you a great example of an anti-fragile business, and this was way back in two thousand and eight or two thousand and nine when there was a um, financial crisis here in Asia. Yep. And the company I was with, you know, things were not going very well. Mm. We we're a multinational. Everyone was being laid off, being sent home, doom and gloom. And I was speaking to my friend and he said, uh, I said to him, man, tough times at the moment. You guys must be struggling. He said, what do you mean? And I said, you, you guys must, you know, everyone's struggling, man. He goes, we're having a great time. Best year ever. Hmm. I said, why? You, but you're in there. You're in there. You know, you're in the, the removal business or the, the business of um, uh, moving expats into a country. You know, uh, I, I don't know what term you use for it. I call it a removal business or, or repatriation business. Yeah. yeah. And he says, you know, when things are going good, we move all the expats into Singapore, all the families, okay, as fast as we can. And then when things go bad, like they are at the moment, we move them all back out again. So it's great. We love change because when there's change, that's, that's what causes either people to come in or people to go out. So they were thriving through mm -hmm. this change. That's an example, uh, a great example of, of an, of an anti-fragile business. So I, um, my life is, is extremely anti-fragile to be anti-fragile in your personal life. You need to be extremely purpose driven. Okay. You know, you're doing something which, which aligns to a higher purpose. Like for me and in, in my big, in my journeys and my long human power journeys, when I have failure after failure, after failure mm -hmm. on these journeys, why would you ever try that again? You've been beaten to pieces three times in a row in that yeah. particular stretch of ocean. I'll say, no, but I've learned so much from each one of those. You know, hmm. each one is making me stronger and more determined to get out there. I'm loving the experience. I literally am relish this experience. It's amazing. Hmm. If I was just doing this for fame or I thought, oh, this is going to make me famous. I don't really like what I'm doing or it's going to make me money. I probably would have given up a long time ago. Yes. So, you know, that's, that's the concept of, of um, anti-fragility and some different examples of it. Okay. So in the current situation, and let's not just talk about current situation. This can happen in any time where a person loses their job or the business collapses. How would they implement anti being anti-fragile into their life? Yeah, so, well, let, let, me, let me start by saying, you know, anti-fragility, of course, has limits. If yep. there's a nuclear explosion right outside your front door, I mean, how can how am I going to benefit from the, from the <laughs> nuclear explosion? Of course, no, so that's it. People... <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> so, so you know, it's it's all relative. But you know, for for that for the people who have businesses um, which have imploded or had to shut down, which is very sad. But I think it's critical for you to learn a lesson from this and, and take this mm. away and think next time, okay, because there will always be a next time. Well, it's, it's, your personal, it's your personal choice whether you want it to be a next time. But if you're anti-fragile, there will be a next time. When you rebuild your business, okay, how can you take this concept of building a business which is, beginning to come, is going to become much more anti-fragile and not mm. fragile or not mm. resilient? Okay, but anti-fragile. How can you build a business which is going to become anti-fragile? So when there's change and stuff, you can actually benefit from it. That's hmm. that's one way you can look at it. The second hmm. thing is um, is that you know you you go through these tough times, um, hmm. and I'm coaching a number of people who are going through really difficult times as well, and um, I'm sharing anti-fragility, the the mindset with them as well, saying, look, your business, you know, what happens to your business. Um, may happen and it, and it, and it may not be ne necessarily very positive in the short term. Yes. You know, some of them may have to close, but if you stand back and look at this from a bigger picture, 
Hmm. And, and don't say, feel sorry for yourself and say, oh, I'm never going to do that again. I should never have done it in the first place, but apply an anti-fragile mindset to this in terms of what can I learn to make hmm. me stronger out of hmm. this? You know, hmm. I just, I've been in this business for four years, for example, or three years. Um, this thing hit, um, I've lost my job or the business closed down in my next step. What can I learn from this to get even stronger? Hmm. That's an example of, um, of uh, applying anti-fragility to people in those really unfortunate situations now. Hmm. Okay. Um, so uh, taking it to, into the life context with what's happening around and especially with a lot of uh, marriages or relationships having issues, um, how would those people implement or take into consideration this thing called anti-fragile? So, okay. they, yeah. so, so here's the thing about anti-fragility, which I haven't actually covered yet, is that anti-fragile systems, mindsets, strategies need disruption, need change to get stronger. Okay. They need it. Hmm. Just like the fragile system. If a fragile system is sitting there and there is no pressure on it, you'll have that cut for 20 years. Yep. For an anti-fragile system to get stronger, it needs change, disruption, some external influence. Hmm. Otherwise, it won't. It won't get any stronger. Hmm. It'll remain inert. Now, anti-fragile is not saying like if you're a couple, if you're in a relationship, that you never have arguments, you never have tough times, you never... Um, um, you know, nothing bad ever happens. I don't think anyone who's been in a relationship that I know of um, ever, ever goes through that. But um, it's, and a marriage is a great example, Rohit, of, of where you can see fragile marriages, you can yeah. see resilient marriages, and you can see anti fragile marriages. You know, the fragile marriage, something changes and they, break, they fall apart. One thing changes. Maybe, maybe they're having a beautiful relationship and everything was going well and their life is wonderful and they post beautiful photos all over Facebook. Then something changes. One loses a job, something happens, and the next minute, oh, we grew apart. Yes. Okay? That's a great example of a fragile, fragile relationship. A resilient relationship might be one where, oh, you know, you see the 60-year-old couple or 70-year-old couple and they're in the restaurant. They're not talking to each other the, the whole evening. And when you do go and talk to them, they say, ah, oh, that old idiot over there, ah, oh, he, he's my husband. <laughs> or, you know, they don't, like, they don't like each other that much, but they've got through, they've got through 50 years of marriage. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, idiot. Let's go home. <laughs> and um, anti-fragile, anti-fragile relationships. And, um, you know, I can think of a, a, a couple of examples of these, um, and you know my personal friendships are ones wow they have tough times yep. um horrible things that happen internally within their families you know externally things outside their control but they they just come together even more mm. stronger they come together they knit they knit more tightly they align they support each other and they strengthen through these mm. um through these tough times the, you've got two beautiful twins uh, i've seen some uh, I've seen some of the um, bo uh, some of the videos you posted on Facebook of them uh, doing some physical activities during this circuit breaker, or to the rest of the world known as lockdown. How do you teach them, you know, kids, to be anti fragile? That's that's a, a really that's a fantastic question. Um, Hold on one minute. My other questions were not fantastic. That's that's really got me cognitively um, um, charging <laughs> very very hard. You know, parenting parenting is is full of um, contradictions. You know, your intuition can your intuition as a parent, unfortunately, can drive you to creating fragile children. Hmm. Because as a parent, when you when you when you have children, it's it's a chemical switch inside your inside your body where suddenly, you know, you are not the most important person in your life anymore. These children are the most important people in your life and you just want to nurture and care for them. Mm. And there's a, there's an expression called 
soccer mums and soccer dads, right? Yes. And I think it's a US, um, a US expression, but it basically, you know, it means those, those parents who um, are so involved in their children's life and so overly protective of them. They're there on the sideline the whole time and they're looking after the children. Don't run here, don't run there, wash your hands, wash this, blah, blah, blah. Don't climb the tree, go and have your bath, blah, 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 blah. Mistakes and then um, and learn from those mistakes. I think that's critical. And in, in, uh, we, we've got twins. One mm. of them has a very anti-fragile mindset already. She was born with it. And she learned to ride a bike uh, four months ahead of the other one. Mm-hmm. The other one, when she falls off her bike, she gets upset. She cries. She gets scared. She gets, and she takes it out in the form of, um, of, of rage, normally on me. Uh, <laughs> and then she won't get on it for the next two weeks. Whereas the other one, when she falls off her bike, she laughs, <laughs> right? And, and we always say that, you know, I always say falling off. What happens when you're falling? Falling off is learning. When we mm. fall off, it's learning, you know, it's fun to fall off. But one of them, because she's a little bit more timid, she's, she has a more of a fragile mindset, whereas the other one is very anti-fragile. Mm. The, how does your, with all of this, you've got this, I mean, I, I, I've looked at, read up on you. I've, I've seen some of your videos you've done. Um, how does your wife take you on with being so anti-fragile? Well, um, well, you, you really are asking some great questions um, today, Rohit. This is yeah. a, a very good, a very good interview. I'm enjoying it um, because you're you're asking me questions which make me think, um, and I and I think are, are very relevant too. Um, so my wife is is not interested in exploratory human powered journeys at all. Even though I've asked her to come with me many times, um, she's always welcome. She's not interested in it at all. So you know, for her, it's difficult to understand my purpose. Mm. You know, to, to, to really relate to it. But what, what I'm very fortunate with her is that um, she's always um, been very supportive. And I don't mean supportive in the sense that when I tell her, hey, I've got an idea, I'm going to quit my job, I'm going to prepare for this expedition for three years, it's going to cost half a million dollars, we're going to have to move house into a much smaller rented property to save costs. There's a massive amount of uncertainty and risk in this, I'll probably be away for about a year. But when I, when I come back from that, I think it could change our family for the better. When I say things like that to her for the first time, she doesn't go, whoopee, yes, let's go let's and do, do it. it. High five, popping the champagne cork. It doesn't work <laughs> like that. And <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, it's a, it's a process. I never spring anything on her. These things take years of, of preparation when I talk to her and tell her about it. And, but the critical thing here that I've built up over the years with her is trust. Mm. Mm. She's got to a point now, you know, when I went to Everest, um, straight after we got married, I went on my first Everest expedition, which did not go well at all. Um, mm. I got, um, I got um, high altitude sickness and it was a very, uh, it was a very touch and go few days there at one point, but she's learned over the years um, and we've built up this trust. And she always says that when I, when I go on expedition, she says, the reason I support you to go out and do this is because I trust you'll make the right decisions at the right time to always come back home safely. Mm. And that trust, that trust is the most strong motivational driver that I could ever have. Mm. I've been on expeditions with some partners where their partners have been on the satellite phone from home screaming at them. Just saying, oh, wow. Come back now you're, you're two days overdue or you know things outside our control and um you know the part i could never live with partners like that personally so that that trust issue um, that we've built up is something that um for mm. me i take very seriously i never want to break that bond of trust interesting so tr- trust is trust seems to be a very crucial part to all of this and um in, in uncertain times, how do we ensure that that trust is, is there? It's not broken, it actually flourishes. Well, you know, a lot of it comes down to decision, decision making. Hmm. And um, at this particular time, there's hundreds of thousands of millions of really bad decisions being made around the world. 
Hmm. Why? Because people are put under pressure. Hmm. Um, they're put under pressure for all sorts of reasons, financial pressure, time hmm. pressure, um, uncertainty pressure, et cetera, et yep. cetera. But the reason trust is normally broken is due to poor decision-making. Hmm. Uh, so one of the critical things to think about during this high period of uncertainty is first of all, be very careful when you make strategic decisions at this mm. time. And by strategic, I'm, I'm, I am um, differentiating, differentiating between operational decisions, what I have for lunch, what are those things I do every single day, to strategic decisions about what's something now. It's going to, you're, you're literally coming to an intersection at the road where you're going to send your business or your personal life mm. off in a completely different direction. You know, a strategic decision can be described as one which kicks off another thousand decisions after it because it's a mm. major turning point. Be very careful making strategic decisions in the middle of a storm. Hmm. Okay. And that storm could be um, just um, a day of the week when you're emotionally upset, or it could be the end of the day with that stormy time at the end of the day when you're cognitively tired. You know, for me, the most um, powerful times of the day for decision making when I'm most cognitively alert and in the best mood and most positive are in the morning between, um, you know, anywhere time between six o'clock in the morning till say 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning. That's mm. the best time for me to make strategic decisions. So be careful that you're not making strategic decisions at the wrong time of the day when you're in the wrong mood or the wrong time of the week where you've just had mm. a bad meeting. Because if you do that, you'll make bad, bad mood generally equals bad decisions. Yeah. So if you make bad decisions, then you'll easily start breaking trust with people. Okay. Um, and um, one other point there was about to say about how do you, um, I mean, this thing about decision making is like, uh, you can be, it can be very uh, easy to feel like you're pushed or forced into the corner to make some decisions at this time. The decisions you're making at this time generally are very complex. They're not simplistic questions. Hmm. So as much as possible, try and get other people involved in your decision making, especially if they're hard, complex, strategic decisions at this time. People hmm. who may be affected by the decision, um, if they are affected by it, try and get them involved as much as possible. Try and, you know, this will help for a start from the political side, at least getting their engagement and then yep. helping them understand the decision making process. It will also help enormously with cognitive diversity, you know, getting people's different viewpoints and, and, and allowing you um, some diversity in, in, the, in the kinds of thoughts, et cetera. So a couple of tips there, really. Just don't make decisions in the storms and try and get people involved in the decision making. That will, that will definitely have an, um, an impact on the trust factor. The other thing which comes up is while you're speaking, you, you were mentioning that was vulnerability. And... Um, there's two corners to this. Some people say you should not be showing your vulnerability, while others say it's good to show your vulnerability. What is your take and what do you recommend to individuals, to leaders, to teams on this? Um, well, Rohit, the questions. <laughs> Luckily, you started with the easy ones at the start. You would have scared me off. <laughs> I'm showing some vulnerability there. Uh, <laughs> okay, that's answered now. Next one. <laughs> uh, I listened. I listened to a, um, a a podcast yesterday where someone said vulnerability is the um, is is the new strength. But um, I personally think vulnerability um, can go a little bit uh, too far, in one way. Yeah. Uh, as well, once you're like, oh, you, you're being so overly overly sharing in your vulnerability then um, I start to feel like vomiting all over the floor. Um, so, so being vulnerable at the right time um, and being, being really authentic about your vulnerability um, at the right time and the right company is, is a very powerful thing. Um, let's face it, not, not, every, not everyone wants to hear vulnerable stories mm. the entire time, but, but I know from personal experience myself, um, opening up about something which is, um, you know, you're, you're, you're scared of or mm. you're intimidated by um, can be a very cathartic experience, mm. especially for men. 
especially mm. for men. I think um, there's too many men who, I mean, even I grew up in a, in a strong rugby culture, it wasn't very cool to go and go and be, um, you know, these days it's called a vulnerable, but in the olden days you would have been called a wuss or, yes. or, or a sook or, or harden up, go and, uh, go and be told to harden up or do something like that. So yeah. well, be a man. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Things like that. And I think we know now that times have changed a lot, that um, being vulnerable is, is actually a strength and it can be very cathartic, but just don't, you, you don't need to overshare it. That's all. Okay. Um, so when you say, uh, Grant, when you say not to overshare it, so for people out there, what is that thing about oversharing? What is that point where you are going into that oversharing? Um, well, possibly, possibly a, a, a line to think of in the distinction here is when it stops becoming about you, hmm. you know, and it starts becoming you're doing this to try and attract attention. So asking okay. yourself that authentic, that authentic question, am I, am I being vulnerable? Am I coming out into the open with this particular issue here for my own benefit? Hmm. Or am I doing it to try and get some likes on LinkedIn? Am I doing it because I know vulnerability is cool now? I know vulnerability is in vogue. And if I can write the story and drop it onto LinkedIn there, I might get, it might go viral and I'll get lots of likes. Yes. For me, if you look at social media, not always, but very often, sometimes I can see stories. I'm like, really? Yeah. <laughs> I've seen those stories. <laughs> Do you get, does that resonate with you? that distinction it does this uh, it does resonate I, you talk about those stories is like you feel something's not there you feel this is a total attention seeking moment That's rather right. than actually genuinely sharing something with which you need some guidance some help some assistance yeah. so you, you you can sense it in the way they write the language in the way, if you're talking to someone, you can also sense it in, in, in that way as well. Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah, the authenticity um, can be quite transparent, I believe, when it comes to these very personal stories. Uh, absolutely. The, the other thing which, which I keep on hearing on a regular basis, Grant, is people saying, uh, you've got to be uh, positive. You've got to be positive. You... And... And this is me personally, I'm not always positive. And then you have some person coming in and saying, no man, bro, you gotta be positive. And I'm like, I'm, I know what the thing is. I know what Did my reality is. Face? No, not, not so far. It's, it's not so far. <laughs> it, it, it does feel sometimes like that. And it's just not me. I hear other, other people talk about this as well. What is this? Overhype about being positive, staying away from negative people, you know, just always being positive. So it, mm. it's just things happen in you and you're conditioned in a certain way uh, that you can't always see positive all the time. I couldn't agree with you more, Rohit. Um, I, and I'll share a story. I made a, I made a fundamental mistake on one of my expeditions where I told my expedition partner, I said, you know, through this next three months together, We've always got to be positive. One thing we've got to focus on with each other is we've always got to be positive. We were mm. rowing a boat through a very remote part of the world and mm. um, a long way away from any assistance if we got into trouble, long way offshore, very stressful. And um, on, on about day for 24 hours um, together, both of us rowing um, until we're exhausted. And then um, my teammate, he, um, he took over for a two hour shift while I went and had a rest. And then we're gonna, we're gonna alternate for two hours on, two hours off to try and break through this current. Hmm. At the end of that two hours, when I came out into the back deck, he said, I got some really good news. And I said, what's that? And he goes, we made a hundred meters of progress in the last two hours. Okay. And um, you know, a hundred meters is pathetic to row for two hours, expend all that energy and, and row uh, hmm. 100 meters only. As he got out of the rowing seat and got back into the cabin to have his rest, um, you know, it takes about a minute, 60 seconds to 90 seconds to, um, to change over. The boat turned around and got blown back by the currents about 500 meters oh, before wow. I could get into my rowing seat. 
And then as I got back in there and I rode, you know, for another two hours, I made a hundred meters during my two hours of rowing, absolutely exhausting myself as well. You know, yep. where this is, this is not sustainable. This is all going in, in a bad direction. And I kept asking myself, why did he say to me, it was really good news. Why did he say that was great news? We, I, we made a hundred meters. And it, and it was driving me crazy for the two hours. And, and to the point where I literally wanted to punch him in the face. I wanted to get into the cabin and, and headbutt him and say, why did you say so something so ridiculous? And then I remembered, I said, because I told him to be like that at the start of the expedition. I mm. told him to always be positive. Mm. That's where I learned a really critical point is that don't be always being positive is for for fairies in fairyland hmm. it's not the reality when hmm. you're in an extreme situation or when you're going through life in general you cannot always be positive just by default because otherwise you would never know what positive felt like it would just be normal you have hmm. to go you have to allow your yourself to experience emotions and hmm. it's critical that we don't always tell ourselves that we have to be positive. That just puts pressure on you. If you're losing mm. your job, if your business is going tits up, if your relationship is falling apart, if you're trying to work from home from a tiny little place and your kids are all around you, they're not, they're not doing their homeschooling whatsoever. Life is mm. terrible. You know, people in your family are sick. Some of them have died from coronavirus. Why should you be positive? Mm. And speaking to someone who says to you, hey, Rohit, come on, man, just be positive. Just be positive about all this. You got to look at the bright side. That's counterproductive. I understand mm. why people say you should be like that, but it's counterproductive. It's non-realistic. Once again, it's said by the people who look at resilience from reading a book and they read, oh, and then neuroscience, it says that positive people are very important because positivity is contagious. Yes, it mm. is. But stop going around saying that nonsense that everyone needs to be positive. Mm. Now, on the flip side of that, you don't want to work with a bunch of negative Nellies either. Yes. You don't want to work with them. Oh, it's terrible. How are you going today, right? Oh, terrible. <laughs> Everything's terrible. You don't want to do that. But what I've found for me, when, when I'm not, when I'm in a, a negative state of mind, I don't, I don't necessarily need someone to solve my problem for me. I just need, you know, when I'm on my boat and I've been flipped upside down in a storm on 500 kilometers offshore, um, I call on the sat phone to my project manager. I don't need him to solve my problem for me. I just need them to listen to me. That's all. I just need to not judge, just listen to me and mm. empathize with the situation. You know, my mm. wife is great at that. She, I'll talk to her and say, I've just been capsized. I'm freezing. There's a big shark that swam under the boat just as I got out of the water. I'm scared. I'm cold. I'm out here. And she listens. She doesn't judge. And that is like, that's medicine. Mm. That's pure in itself. And if I mm. had someone on another phone who was saying, oh, just be positive, you know, not many people get to see a shark swim underneath the boat then I would feel like punching them in the head. So um, and the shark is eating me up. <laughs> yeah. You're lucky. Not many people have spoken on the phone and been eaten by a shark at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, amazing. Amazing. So to end of the end, the, end this interview, this talk, what is that one thing or couple of things which people could currently do so they feel or they see that they're moving forward rather than being just stagnant or moving backwards? What is that they can do to um, get out of this tough, I mean, get out into thinking a more optimistic way, I'm not going to use the word positive, but in a more op optimistic way? Mm. Well, um, firstly, um, the, the, the slogan on my rowing boat is that no storms ever last. I saw that, yes. And under, underneath that, it's a row, you bastard, row. So uh, it was just a reminder on the boat, you know, but when things are going, uh, are going bad, it will never last. It can never last forever. So mm. all this is going to pass. It will mm. pass. Life will change. It will mm. improve for some. It will get worse for others but things things will change so you you have to remember that and the way things are changing at the moment is every week things are changing so you may yeah. not have to wait that long before before there's a, a significant change and and the next thing is um really i mean i just encourage people to think of being anti-fragile mm. and where do you want to be in where do you want your life to be in 
within within um, these these three silos. Do you want to have a fragile life, a fragile business, a fragile relationship, or do mm. you have a resilient relationship, a resilient business, a resilient mindset, or can you going forward from this point start to think how can I make this more anti fragile? You know, mm. and if you want to do that from a personal perspective finding your purpose, following something or doing something which you're strongly purpose driven around. Mm. That is one of the first steps to getting yourself into that anti-fragile zone. When you're in that anti-fragile zone, failures, setbacks, things not going right, don't matter because you're doing what you love or you're doing what, what drives you and you'll just keep doing it every single day, no matter what, even if you were paid or you weren't paid because that's just what you do. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much for those insights. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Grant. How can people contact you, Grant? What can they do to contact you? Um, thanks, Rohit. So they can contact me through my uh, website, which is www.powerful-humans.com. Um, and yeah, you can contact me through there or you can find my LinkedIn or um, Facebook and my email contacts are all on that on that website. Yeah. So hey, from my side, it's been an absolute honor to be on your show today. I love the work that you're doing as well. Thank you. And um, and uh, all the best, all the best over there in Dubai. And uh, hopefully you can um, you can uh, keep moving ahead.